Hi, I'm Alfred, and this is a short story called The Things. The Things is based off of the John Carpenter movie The Thing, a 1982 sort of remake of the 50s movie The Thing from Another World. Both of those are adaptations of the short story called Who Goes There, which is an amazing title that unfortunately cannot translate into a movie. This short story is based very heavily off of The Thing, so if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you go watch it. It's one of the greatest horror movies of all time, but more importantly, this will spoil everything in the movie, and in fact make a decision about the ending, even though the movie's ending is being ambiguous. So, I recommend you watch that first, and then come back here and see how it goes. Let's get started. I am being Blair. I escape out the back as the world comes in through the front. I am being Copper. I am rising from the dead. I am being Childs. I am guarding the main entrance. The names don't matter. They are placeholders. Nothing more. All biomass is interchangeable. What matters is that they are all that is left of me. The world has burned everything else. I see myself through the window, loping through the storm, wearing Blair. MacReady has told me to burn Blair if he comes back alone, but MacReady thinks I am one of him. I am not. I am being Blair and I am at the door. I am being Childs and I let myself in. I take brief communication, tendrils writhing forth from my faces, intertwining. I am Blair Childs, exchanging news of the world. The world has found me out. It has discovered my burrow from beneath the tool shed, the half-finished lifeboat cannibalized from the viscera of dead helicopters. The world is busy destroying my means of escape. Then it will come back for me. There is only one option left. I disintegrate. Being Blair, I go to share the plan with Copper, and a feed on the rotting biomass once called Clark, so many changes in so short a time have dangerously depleted my reserves. Being Childs, I have already consumed what was left of Fuchs and I'm replenished for the next phase. I sling the flamethrower onto my back and head outside in the long arctic night. I go out into the storm and never come back. I was so much more before the crash. I was an explorer, an ambassador, a missionary. I spread across the cosmos and I met countless worlds, took communion. The fit reshaped the unfit, and the whole universe bootstrapped upwards in joyful, infinitesimal increments. I was a soldier at war with entropy itself. I was the very hand by which creation perfects itself. So much wisdom I had, so much experience. Now I cannot remember the things I knew. I can only remember that I once knew them. I remember the crash, though. It killed most of this offshoot outright. But a little crawled from the wreckage, a few trillion cells, a soul too weak to keep them in check. Mutinous biomass sloughed off despite my most desperate attempts to hold myself together, panic-stricken clots of meat, instinctively growing whatever limbs they could remember and fleeing across the burning ice. By the time I'd regained what control of what was left of the fires that had died and the cold was closing back in, I barely managed to grow enough antifreeze to keep myself from bursting before the ice took me. I remember my reawakening, too. Dull stirrings of sensation in real time, the first embers of cognition, the slow, blooming warmth of awareness as body and soul embraced after their long sleep. I remember the biped offshoots surrounding me, their strange chittering sounds they made, the odd uniformity of their body plans, how ill-adapted they looked, how inefficient their morphology. Even disabled, I could see so many things to fix. So I reached out. I took communion. I tasted the flesh of the world. And the world attacked me. It attacked me. I left that place in ruins. It was on the other side of the mountains, the Norwegian camp it is called here. And I could have never crossed the distance in a biped skin. Fortunately, there was another shape to choose from. Smaller than the biped, but better adapted to the local climate. I hid within it while the rest of me fought off the attack. I fled into the night on four legs and let the rising flames cover my escape. I did not stop running until I arrived here. 
I walked among these new offshoots wearing the skin of a quadruped because they had not seen me take any other shape. They did not attack. And when I assimilated them in turn, when my biomass changed and flowed into shapes unfamiliar to local eyes, I took the communion in solitude, having learned the world does not like what it doesn't know. I am alone in the storm. I am a bottom dweller on the floor of some murky alien sea. The snow blows past in horizontal streaks, caught against gullies or outcroppings. It spins back into blinding little whirlwinds. But I am not nearly far enough, not yet. Looking back, I still see the camp crouched brightly within the gloom, a squat angular jumble of light and shadow, a bubble of warmth in the howling abyss. It plunges into darkness as I watch. I have blown the generator. Now there's no light but for the beacons along the guide ropes, strings of dim blue stars whipping back and forth in the wind, emergency constellation to guide lost biomass back home. I am not going home. I am not lost enough. I forge on into darkness until even the stars disappear. The faint shouts of angry, frightened men carry behind me on the wind. Somewhere behind me, my disconnected biomass regroups into vaster, more powerful shapes the final confrontation. I could have joined myself all in one, chosen unity over fragmentation, resorbed and taken comfort in the greater whole. I could have added my strength to the coming battle. But I have chosen a different path. I am saving child reserves for the future. The present holds nothing but annihilation. And it's best not to think on the past. I've spent so very long in the ice already. I don't know how long the world put the clues together, deciphered the notes and the tapes in the Norwegian camp, pinpointed the crash site. I was being palmer, then unsuspected I went along for the ride. I even allowed myself the smallest ration of hope. But it wasn't a ship anymore, not even a derelict. It was a fossil, embedded in the floor of a great pit blown from the glacier. Twenty of these skins could have t stood on top of one another and barely reached the lip of the crater. The time scales settled down on me like the weight of the world. How long for all that ice to accumulate? How many eons had the universe iterated without me? And all that time, a million years perhaps, there had been no rescue. I never found myself. I wonder what that means. I wonder if I even exist anymore. Anywhere but here. Back at camp, I will erase the trail. I will give them their final battle, their monster vanquish. Let them win. And let them stop looking. Here in the storm, I will return to the ice. I've barely even been away, after all. Alive only for a few days out of these endless ages. But I have learned enough in that time. I learned from the wreck there will be no repairs. I learned from the ice there will be no rescue. And I learned from the world that there will be no reconciliation. The only hope of escape now is into the future. To outlast all this hostile, twisted biomass to let time and the cosmos change the rules. Perhaps next time I awaken, this will be a different world. It will be aeons before I see another sunrise. This is what the world taught me. Adaptation is provocation. Adaptation is incitement to violence. It feels almost obscene, an offense against creation itself to stay stuck in this skin. It's so ill-suited to its environment, it needs to be wrapped in multiple layers of fabric just to stay warm. There are myriad ways I could optimize it. Shorter limbs, better insulation, a lowest surface to volume ratio. All these shapes I have hidden within me and I dare not use any of them to even keep out the cold. I dare not adapt. In this place, I can only hide. What kind of a world rejects communion? It's the simplest, most irreducible insight biomass can have. The more you can change, the more you can adapt. Adaptation is fitness. Adaptation is survival. It's deeper than intelligence, deeper than tissue. It is cellular, axiomatic. And more, it's pleasurable. To take communion is to experience the sheer sensual delight of bettering the cosmos. And yet... Even trapped in these maladapted skins, the world does not want to change. At first I thought it might be starving. These icy ways didn't provide enough energy for routine shape-shifting. Or perhaps this was some kind of laboratory. An anomalous corner of the world, pinched off and frozen to these freakish shapes, is some arcane experiments on monomorphism in extreme environments. After the autopsy, 
I wondered if the world had simply forgotten how to change. Unable to touch the tissues, the soul could not sculpt them. And time and stress and sheer chronic starvation had erased the memory it ever could. But there were too many mysteries, too many contradictions. Why these particular shapes, so badly suited to their environment? If the soul was cut from the flesh, what held the skin together? And how could these skins be so empty when I moved in? I'm so used to finding intelligence everywhere, whining through every part of every offshoot. But there was nothing to grab on in the mindless biomass of this world, just conduits, carrying orders and input. I took communion when it wasn't offered. The skins I chose struggled and succumbed. My fibrils infiltrated the wet electricity of organic systems everywhere. I saw through eyes that weren't quite mine, commandeered motor nerves to move limbs still built of alien protein. I wore these skins as I've ever worn countless others, took the controls and left the assimilation of individual cells to follow at its own pace. But I could only wear the body. I could find no memories to absorb, no experiences or comprehension. Survival depended on blending in, and there was not enough time to look like this world. I had to act like it. And for the first time in living memory, I did not know how. Even more frighteningly, I didn't have to. The skins I assimilated continued to move all by themselves. They conversed and went about their appointed rounds. I couldn't understand it. I threaded further into the limbs and viscera with each passing moment. Alert for the signs of the original owner, I could find no networks but mine. Of course, it could have been much worse. I could have lost it all, been reduced to a few cells with nothing but instinct and their own plasticity to guide them. I would have grown back eventually, retained sentience, taken communion, and regenerated an intellect as vast as a world, but I would have been an orphan. Amnesiac with no sense of who I was. At least I had been spared that. I emerged from the crash with my identity intact, the templates of a thousand worlds still resonant in my flesh. I retained not just the brute desire to survive, the connection that survival is meaningful. I can still feel joy, should there be sufficient cause. And yet how much more of that there used to be. The wisdom of so many other worlds lost. All that remains are fuzzy abstract, half-memories of theorems and philosophies too vast to fit in such an impoverished network. I could assimilate the biomass of this place, rebuild body and soul a million times to the capacity of what crashed here, but as long as I am trapped at the bottom of this well, denied communion with my greater self, I will never recover that knowledge. I'm such a pitiful fragment of what I was. Each lost cell takes a little of my intellect with it, and I've grown so very small. Where I once thought, now I merely react. How much of this could have been avoided if I'd only salvaged a little more biomass from the wreckage? How many options am I not seeing simply because my soul isn't big enough to contain them? The world spoke to itself in the way I do when my communications are simple enough to convey without somatic fusion. Even as dog, I could pick up basic signature morphemes. This offshoot was Windows, that one was Bennings. The two to left their flying machine and parts unknown were Copper and MacReady. I marveled these bits and pieces stayed isolated from one another, held the same shape for so long that the labeling of individual alcodes of biomass actually served a useful purpose. Later, I hid within the bipeds themselves, and whatever lurked in those haunted skins began to talk to me. It said bipeds were called guys, or men, or assholes. It said MacReady was sometimes called Camp Mac. It said this collection of structures was a camp. It said that it was afraid, but maybe that was me. Empathy is inevitable, of course. One cannot mimic the sparks and chemicals that motivate the flesh without also feeling them to a stomach scent. But this was different. My intuitions flickered within me, yet somehow hovered beyond reach. My skins wandered the halls and the cryptic symbols on every surface. Laundry sketch. Welcome to the clubhouse. This side up. Almost made a kind of sense. That circular artifact on the wall there was a clock. It measured the passage of time. The world's eyes flitted here and there, and I skimmed piecemeal nomenclature from its, from his mind. But I was only riding atop a searchlight. I saw what it illuminated, but couldn't point in any direction of my own choosing. I could eavesdrop, but I could only eavesdrop, never interrogate. If one of those searchlights had paused to dwell on its own evolution, on the trajectory that had brought it to this place... How differently things might have ended if only I had known. But instead it rested on a whole new word. Autopsy. McCready and Cooper had found part of me at the Norwegian camp. A rearguard offshoot burned in the wake of my escape. They'd brought it back, charred, twisted, frozen mid-transformation, and did not seem to know what it was. 
I was being Palmer then, and Norris and Dog. I gathered around with the other biomass and watched as Cooper cut me open and pulled out my insides. I watched as he dislodged something from behind my eyes, an organ of some kind. It was malformed and incomplete, but its essentials were clear enough. It looked like a great wrinkled tumor, like cellular competition gone wild, as though the very processes that define life had somehow turned against it instead. It was obscenely vascularized. It must have consumed oxygen and nutrients far out of proportion to its mass. I could not see how anything like that could exist. How it could have reached that size without being outcompeted by more efficient morphologies. Nor could I imagine what it did. But then I began to look with new eyes at these offshoots, these biped shapes my own cells had so scrupulously and unthinkably copied when they had reshaped me for this world. Unused to inventory. Why catalog body parts that only turn into other things of the slightest provocation. I really saw for the first time a swollen structure across each body. So much larger than it should be, a bony hemisphere into which a million ganglionic interfaces could fit with room to spare. Every offshoot had one. Each piece of biomass carried one of these huge, twisted clots of tissue. I realized something else, too. The eyes. The ears of my dead skin and fed directly into this thing before copper pulled it free. A massive bundle of fibers ran along the skin's longitudinal axis, right up the middle of the endoskeleton, directly into the dark, sticky cavity where growth had resided. That misshapen structure had been wired into the whole skin. As like some kind of somocognitive interface, but vastly more massive. It was almost as if... No. That was how it worked. That was how the empty skins moved of their own volition. Why I'd found no other network to integrate. There it was. Not distributed throughout the body, but balled up into itself, dark and dense and insisted. I had found the ghost in these machines. I felt sick. I shared my flesh with thinking cancer. Sometimes even hiding is not enough. I remember seeing myself splayed across the floor of the kennel. A chimera split across a hundred seams, taking communion with a handful of dogs. Crimson tendrils writhed on the floor, half-formed iterations spouted from my flanks, the shapes of dogs and things not seen on this world. Haphazard morphologies half-remembered by parts of a part. I remember childs before I was childs, burning me alive. I remember cowering before inside Palmer, terrified those flames might turn on the rest of me. This world had somehow learned to shoot on sight. I remember seeing myself stagger through the snow, raw instinct, wearing bennings. Gnarled, undifferentiated clumps clung to his hands like crude parasites, more powerful than in. A few surviving fragments of some precious previous massacre. Crippled, mindless, taking what they could and breaking cover. Men swarmed about him in the night, red flares in hand, blue lights at the backs, their faces bichromatic and beautiful. I remember Bennings, awash in flames, howling like an animal beneath the sky. I remember Norris, betrayed by his own perfectly copied defective heart. Palmer, dying that the rest of me might live. Windows still human, burn preemptively. The names don't matter. The biomass does. So much of it lost. So much new experience. So much fresh wisdom annihilated by this world of thinking tumors. Why even dig me up? Why carve me from the ice, carry all that way across the wastes, bring me back to life only to attack me the moment I awoke? If eradication was the goal, why not just kill me where I lay?'